During the final days of World War II, in the hills of southern Czechoslovakia, U.S. Army cameras recorded the aftermath of a little-known Nazi atrocity. American troops had come upon the bodies of young women who had been killed during the final stages of a three-month death march. Of the 2,000 women who began the march, fewer than 150 would survive to be liberated. For each of the survivors, liberation would mark the end of a six-year nightmare through ghettos, deportations, slave labor camps, and forced marches. These are the memories of one of those survivors. I was the only one from my family who survived. The only one of my dearest friends. In August 1939, 15-year-old Gerda Weissman returned from a summer vacation to her family home in Bielsko, Poland. She was to begin school within a few weeks. On September 1st, World War II began with the German invasion of Poland. Within hours, the peaceful city of Bielsko was overtaken by the German army. I remember we were sitting at breakfast. It was a beautiful, beautiful autumn day. Very bright, very golden. We were all together, and it seems all activity outside has, has stopped as well. And um, it was sort of a very, very special memorable day because it had no, no intrusion whatsoever. Then in the evening, a great deal of activity started. There was shooting, there were planes, uh, there were some explosions. We went to the basement. My cat was outside, and my brother went out to let the cat in. The cat was meowing. And he came back with a hole in his trouser. And he said there was shooting from the rooftops. And the, the Germans were coming. And at that moment, we had an incredible roar and a motorcycle came down the street and it had a side kind and then there were people in different uniforms. You know, our army, the Polish army, had sort of uh, beige khaki uniforms and those uniforms were green. And people were shouting, you know, Heil Hitler, long live the Führer, and, 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 and people were waving flags with swastikas. There was that feeling of complete Betrayal, suddenly sudden you were home and, and you were not home anymore. <laughs> he was really my hero, very accomplished and everything he touched he seemed to be able to do well and he was a wonderful brother, he always protected me and uh, and of course, he had his friends coming to the house, so there were boys around, you know, and I, I started to get interested in boys. And, and a lot of my friends were seeking my friendship because of my brother. Unfortunately, uh, pretty soon orders came for all young men to register between 16 and 50. And, uh, and they were taken away. Um, the last day before Arthur left, as a matter of fact, the night before I, I went to his room, and when I was little, I used to always go, and he was, would read me stories, and then he would throw me out of his room, but apparently he didn't that night. And I must have fallen asleep at the foot of his bed. Um, when he left, he asked me to be strong and to look after our parents. 
My mother didn't make his bed for a very long time. Put the imprint of his head. I guess the loss of my brother is the hardest one to bear. The war started in September. By, by Christmas, we had to move to the basement of our home. It was very cold and clammy. We, we had no, no running water, no electricity, and uh, uh, things were really quite bad, but we were still in our own home. Uh, and spring was very difficult because I always loved my garden. I used to spend a lot of time there as a child. And the sign appeared that the dogs and Jews were not permitted to enter. I remember I, I said, I don't care what they're going to do. I had to see my garden again. It was a beautiful, a fragrant spring morning. It was in April. And uh, I remember I jumped over the fence and went to the garden and pretended that, uh, that I was just I was picking violets. I could see from the garden the room which had been mine, the wallpaper. Um, even though we lived in the basement, I was still there. And I pretended just for a little bit what it would be like if, um, if the war hadn't happened. If I would be going in, my mother would say, and I need to take my raincoat to school, and my brother would be hurrying off, my father would be going to his office. My mother would be setting the table for breakfast and urging us to do this or that. And I remember it was sort of the most incredible thing that um, the reality, which I had always taken for granted, now became um, the most remote fantasy. worst day of my life, the 28th of June, 42. Um, that is when I saw my father for the last time. Oh, the day before, um, we were, I, I heard my parents, of course, you know, we all lived in one room, and I heard my parents talk through that night. And I still cannot comprehend their incredible bravery. They spoke only of, of their lives together, of their love, of their good times, of their children, of their parents. And with that, they faced the morning. Well, after my father left, my poor mother, you know, I remember I begged her to have something to eat and she wouldn't. But she had also uh, saved from before the war a bit of cocoa and, uh, and some jam. And she decided to make that cocoa for me that morning. And I remember all those years looking at that cocoa was great longing. We didn't have any throughout but it didn't taste particularly sweet on that morning. We had to march through our town and um, I guess it's a sort of a similar journey than a journey to execution when I think of it now, because, uh, you know, you saw people looking out from behind curtains, some waving sort of a mute farewell, uh, seeing um, somebody was painting a new sign on a shop. The movie was putting on a new feature on the marquee. And, uh, and we were marching. It 
was an SS man there that, um, that was near the railroad tracks where the circus used to come. It was sort of a, an empty place. I, I was with my mother and a number of my friends as well with their mothers. And um, we heard that Marin was there. Um, Marin was um, a man of, um, if the stories were to believe, of uh, not anyone to, to be greatly admired. He uh, was, was working with the government there. He was standing to the side. We had to form a line, and an SS man stood there with, um, with a little stick. And um, I was holding hands with my mother. I came up to him, and he looked at me, and he says, how old? I said, 18. And he sort of pushed me to one side and my mother to the other side. I, I wasn't aware what was happening at that particular point. But uh, shortly thereafter, when I stood with my other friends, who were also separated from their mothers, we realized that we were going to go to separate places. And there was enclosures, an enclosure there this barbed wire to, to the right where our mothers were, and we were immediately taken to, to the left. Now, again, I, I don't remember the time sequence at all. I just remember a tremendous panic. And, uh, and shortly thereafter, some trucks arrived, uh, open trucks with, with sort of a gate behind it, and we were loaded on the truck. And... Uh, I heard my mother's voice from very far to ask, where to? And I shouted back, I don't know. And I guess I must have been aware that, that I was taken away from my mother, so I jumped off. And Marin came, and he was a very slight, small man. We didn't expect such strength in him. And he picked me up bodily, and he threw me on the truck, and he says, you are too young to die. And uh, I guess... The trucks were set in motion. I just heard my mother's voice and it came like an echo and she was saying, you know, be strong, you know, sei stark in, in, in German. And then the trucks rolled out of there and ironically the, the sun came out, sort of, um, I still see it, the rooftops sort of wet, illuminated by the sun and the church bells ringing. And that was the last view. I take him to a train. And of course, and I was with my friends, and I think we, we all started talking, and facing the reality, what was probably happening. And I had a friend by the name of Ilse Kleinsailer. I'd known Ilse since, since childhood. Ilse was a little younger than I. And we looked quite a bit alike, and people took us as sisters. And as a matter of fact, and Ilse had a horrible headache on the train, and, and she said, oh, somebody would just have an aspirin or something. And, and there was this really stunning, beautiful, tall, slim, red-headed girl my friendly face, and she said, oh, I, I have one. And she gave it to me, and I gave it to Ilse. And she introduced herself in sort of in a very open manner, and she's my, she said, my name is Susie Kunz. And of course, I told her mine, and uh, we started talking. And the windows of the train were open, it was a beautiful summer day, and uh, said, won't it be fun when we make that journey back? And we were sort of, back and forth, and, and um, she said that that war is going to go on for a long time, and I said, no, it won't. And um, she said, it's going to be years. I said, no, it's going to be less than six months. And she said, I wouldn't bet on that. And I said, I would. And we made a bet and we shook hands on that. And the bet was for a quart of strawberries and some whipped cream to be payable after the war. I lost that bet.
victim camp. We came to, um, was a small town called Bolkenhain, I remember. We were marched from the railroad station. People looked very curiously at us. Um, we came to an enclosure um, adjacent to a factory, which I had a couple, a, a, a barrack. And um, it was a tremendous click as the gates closed, sort of a finality. Yeah. And there stood a woman clad all in black. And she was literally barking. I've never heard a human voice uh, being that harsh. She looked like a bulldog, she, you know. And uh, I said, this is, this is going to be absolutely the worst. We were supposed to refer to her as um, Frau Kügler. She turned out to be the hope, the inspiration, and the knowledge that perhaps not all Germans were cruel. She was a decent, wonderful, warm, caring human being. No doubt she was picked for her position because of her looks, but uh, her looks completely belied what was underneath it all. We stayed in that camp for a little over a year. No one was sent to Auschwitz. Uh, I don't know if she particularly loved us, but um, she pinned a lie to the lips of all those who said they had no choice. I personally am indebted to her for my own life at one point, when this infamous Lindner, who was known for his cruelty, swooped down to for an inspection of the camp. And I had been very ill at the time. I was running a very high fever, and I was permitted to stay in my bunk. And she came in, there were two, no, there were three of us who were ill. And she came and she said, girls, get yourself together. I remember she stooped down to tie my boots and she literally dragged me and the two other girls to the factory. And she set my looms in motion and she said, pull yourself together, this is life or death today. Metzdorf was a horrible camp. We were housed in, in a building maybe on the sixth or seventh or eighth floor, way up, and it was terribly hot. We worked at different jobs there. There were several that were uh, dreadful. And I remember my resistance really weakening there, and I thought to myself, once after the, uh, the cold car was empty and I was with that, standing on that, with that shovel in my hand and I, I said it would be so easy now to jump an oncoming train and it would be over in, in a couple seconds and become a part of that stillness not to have to face tomorrow. What's, what's going to be tomorrow? It's going to be flax in the morning and, and the bundles at night and, and the swamp again and the hunger and that and I, I, I just felt I had enough. And I thought to myself, it's time to do it. And I heard very faint and coming of a train, very far away probably. Suddenly I felt pain in my both sides of my, my neck. Very sharp. And um, it was right at the beginning of the war when we had not heard from my brother. My mother was sick. And we were told that we had to leave with 20 pounds of our belongings, our home. And I remember standing there, and we heard of a family who committed suicide together. And I sort of half wished that my parents had suggested it. And I remember standing at the window and thinking about that. My father came up behind me, and uh, he, he always knew what I was thinking. And he, he said to me, what, what you are thinking is, is wrong. It's cowardly. It, it, it's terrible. He said, you promised me never to do that, no matter what. And I didn't answer him. And then he, he sort of took me, he took my head like that, and he turned it toward me, toward him, and he looked at me, and he said, I want your promise now. And I said, Papa, I, I promise. 
and um, during those last days in Matsdorf, that promise became pretty faint. And I knew that the train was going to come, and I figured I, I'm going to jump. Suddenly, I felt that very sharp pain in my neck, and the promise came back, and obviously, I didn't. It was bitter cold, it was in January. And I was coughing terribly, I had a very bad cold. And my three dearest friends, Susie Kunz, Liesl Stepper, and Ilse Kleinzeller, and I, we huddled together, the four of us. And they, they were very concerned about me. They said, you know, if you can only pull through with a terrible cold and a terrible cough, might be pneumonia, what have you. And in the morning, very early, the doors opened, not to the type of freedom we had hoped, but it opened to an, an incredible picture. There was freshly fallen snow for as far as the eye could see. It was an enormous, it was a plateau, and then came up to, to a gentle hill. And it was just covered with snow. It was gray, it was snowing. And uh, we were told to uh, assemble four abreast. So, of course, there were the four of us. And uh, we held hands and we took the first step. And I guess we all knew that this is going to be the first step to the end of the road, either to liberation or to, to doom. And in front of us stretched this incredible line. When people looked, you know, it's gray um, camp blankets over him. They looked like winged deaths. That's all you could see. Way, way ahead, 4,000 girls. And on the side was the SS men and the SS women, and they lifted their whips, and they said, forward march. And we started to march. It was the 29th of January. Uh, we we left a lot of girls lying in the snow. Many were killed. It was something one can barely, can really not describe. My father had asked me when I last saw him in June, the very last day, practically in the last moment. Before he left, he said to me, wear your skiing boots. And I said, why? And he said, I want you to wear them today. I said, Papa, skiing shoes in June. He said, I want you to wear them. One didn't argue with one's father. So I put on those boots and I wore them throughout my entire stay in the camps for three years. And in them I'd also hidden the pictures of my parents and my brother. I didn't know and I I don't know how my father could have known that those boots were really instrumental in saving my life on that march. I had ski shoes. Some girls had sandals. We slept outside. The frost, I saw girls breaking off their toes like twigs. I had my ski boots. We didn't get anything to eat for days, literally. We were bitter cold and hungry and everything, and um, I was planning a party after the war. And I had the dilemma for almost an entire day, I should have a blue velvet dress or a red velvet dress. I couldn't resolve it. I really liked the color blue much better as a color, but I knew that red looked better on me. So, um, but you could occupy your mind and hang your thoughts on trivia of that nature, and they became very important, and this is how you passed the hours and forgot the hunger and, and the cold. And I, um, I do believe that if you were blessed with imagination, that 
that you could work that. Um, if unfortunately you were a person that faced the reality, I think you didn't have much of a chance. We devised a, sort of what we thought an incredible plan to run away. That was when we saw refugees on, on the road who spoke similar German than we did. So we thought that the next stop, we are going to disappear in the woods. And uh, we, we stopped for that rest. And I remember giving Gilda sort of a sign with my eyebrows that we should now disappear into the woods, pretending that we needed to go to relieve ourselves. And suddenly she looked up and she said, I'm afraid. And normally, I must say, I, o I overruled her, you know, in most instances. And suddenly I lost. I think my courage as well. And I said, okay, maybe, maybe we'll do it on the next stop. And we came out of the forest and then we heard horrible screams. And 14 girls had hidden, had the same ideas we did, and they were all killed in front of us. That's when I decided, no matter what, I'm never going to try to run away. We'll go to the end, whatever the end will be. On the 28th of April, Ilda wasn't well at all. She was sort of hallucinating. She was saying things which I didn't know what she meant. But then she became totally lucid. And one of the most shocking things was that one of my other friends had somehow found two potatoes. And she gave them to me. She said, it's for you and for Ilse. I gave Ilse the potato, and she said she wasn't hungry. It was the most incredible statement, not to be hungry. And she said to me, you eat it. And then she said, She said, I'm angry at no one. And I hope nobody is angry at me. And then she said, if my parents and Kitty, Kitty was her little sister, she said, if they survive, don't tell them how I died. And then she said to me, you'll be alone. She said, but you have always been lucky. And there was a little brook nearby, so I got up and I wanted to get it. And as Esmond came and he shoved me, and I begged him to let me have water for her. And he kicked her head. So it was raining and sort of... So I caught some water in my hands and I gave it to her. And I held her, and we both fell asleep. I woke up, but she didn't. And I remember sitting there and, and really knowing that this was definitely the end. We heard American planes overhead, there was shooting. Uh, the, the German army was running away. There were um, people on the roads with children, with animals, tremendous chaos. We were very, very ill. I weighed 68 pounds, my hair was white. So I was going to be 21 the following day. That morning, I went to look for Susie, because Liesl said to me, Susie went out to get some water, and she has not returned. So I went out to look for her. 
I found her near the pump. I thought she had fainted, but I touched her. And she was gone. I wanted to tell her, Susie, and I did tell her. I said, Susie, we are liberated, we are free. We had made a bet more than three years earlier on a train which took us to camp. A bet for a quart of strawberries and cream to be payable after the war. I said we will be liberated. And she said we would not. My, my very clear um, view of, of freedom and liberation came that morning when I stood in this doorway of that abandoned factory. And I saw a car coming down the hill. And the reality of that came when I saw the white star on its hood and not the swastika. And there were two men in that car. One jumped out. I saw some skeletal figures uh, uh, trying to, to get some water from a hand pump. But over on the other side, uh, uh, leaning uh, next to the end, against the wall, next to the entrance of the building, I saw a girl standing, and, and I decided to go walk up to her. I remember that aura of, ink, of that awe, of, of, of the disbelief in daylight, to really see someone who fought for our freedom, for my ideals. And uh, he looked like, like God to me. And I asked her in German and in English whether she spoke either language, and she answered me in, in German. I, uh, I knew what I had to say. And I said to him, we are Jewish, you know, for a very long time. At least to me it seemed very long. But he didn't answer me. And then his own voice betrayed his emotion. He was wearing dark glasses. I couldn't see his eyes. He said, so am I. I asked uh, about her companions, and she, she said, uh, come, let me show you. He said, may I see the other ladies? a form of address we hadn't heard for six years. I told him that most of the girls were inside, they were too ill to walk, and he said to me, won't you come with me? I didn't know what he meant. So he, he held the door open for me and let me proceed him. And that was the moment of restoration of of humanity, of humaneness, of dignity, of freedom. We went inside the factory. Uh, it was an indescribable scene. Uh, there were women scattered over the floor on scraps of straw, uh, some, some of them quite obviously with a mark of death on their faces. Something that I have never been able to forget uh, was an extraordinary thing that happened. Uh, the girl who was my guide uh, made sort of a sweeping gesture over this scene of devastation and said the following words. Noble be man, merciful and good. And I could hardly believe that she was able to summon a poem by the German poet Goethe, which was called, is called the divine uh, at such a moment. And there was nothing that she could have said that would have underscored the 
grim irony of the situation better than than what she did. And this first young American of Liberation Day is now my husband. He opened not only the door for me, but the door to my life and my future. Gerda Weissman and Kurt Klein were married in June of 1946. Gerda Weissman would never find out what happened to her brother. Her father and mother are known to have been deported to Auschwitz. Kurt Klein's parents were unable to escape Nazi Germany. They too are reported to have died in Auschwitz. Of the 2,000 women who began the death march, most would die along the route to Czechoslovakia. 95 of these women are memorialized in this small cemetery in Volary. Among the monuments are those dedicated to Liesl Stepper, Susie Kuhns, and Ilse Kleinsailer, the friends of a young survivor named Gerda Weissmann. <laughs> 